Okay, it's time for another video. It is Sunday evening, and this week we are talking about high magic and low magic. Uh, this is a potentially triggering topic because a lot of what's going on right now in the media and in entertainment is heavily focused on prejudice and racism and dividing people up into categories and things like that, right? And uh, when, as magic developed, uh, I guess through the 19th, uh, through the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries, uh, the idea of high and, mag and low magic came about. And this kind of parallels um, what was going on at the time with other ideas of high and low. For instance, uh, as the language of German developed, there was a high German uh, distinguishable from a low German. And primarily what that meant was that in the south of Germany, those were the mountainous regions, and the people there spoke a particular type of German. And then the people in the lower lands spoke a different kind of German. And the two, of course, interacted, those two groups of people interacted. Now, the interesting thing about that is um, that the people who lived on the higher ground at the time, uh, they tended to live on land that was not as conducive to farming. And so what tended to happen is that the people who worked in the lowlands tended to work to produce the food for the people who lived in the highlands. Okay, it was a tendency. It's not entirely true because you can grow food <laughs> in the mountains. Um, so um, that idea of high German, uh, it went through some changes. Apparently, um, uh, high German became associated with the more refined, <clears throat> more learned, learned forms of German. Okay, uh, the way it is now, apparently, the high German. And um, the same thing sort of happened in English, where you have the King's English. Uh-oh, the High English and the Low English, right? Um, the King's English, like high-class English. And, well, those who could spend the time to refine their thinking and their language, and how do you refine your thinking? You refine your language, okay? Those who would do that and who groomed themselves to be leaders... Uh, would be conceivably better off speaking High German or High English or King's English, <laughs> okay? Uh, and uh, the less educated workers uh, would not have that luxury of learning those uh, types of, the, that type of thinking, that type of language, okay? Um, did that make the person who spoke a... Uh, King's English superior to the people who uh, did not speak it? Well, <laughs> of course not. But that idea began to develop as well. And so the idea of the high forms of English being superior to the lower forms um, becomes a problem. Okay. And that's pretty obvious, you know. Um, and so the same uh, problem then begins to infest <laughs> these, this idea of high magic and low magic. Uh, high magic and low magic pretty much evolved the same way. The high magic is more sort of educated, refined, intellectual. And the low magic tends to be the more pagan, the more rural, possibly even hunter-gatherer which is not as refined as the kind of magic that a ruler would use. So somebody who is in charge of a city-state would, would learn a more refined type of language, as well as a more refined kind of magic. And uh, there's some evidence, and like in India, that the that when magic seems to have been sort of evil and forbidden among the 
lower classes, and uh, but it was, of course, the nobility could do what they wanted, and they so they practiced magic, and they practiced apparently some of them practiced forms of magic that you know groomed them and made them more powerful or able to project power, charisma, authority, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, so the idea of going to charm school and learning good manners, these are all sort of associated with high magic, whereas low magic is more of the country folk who may or may not speak as clearly or have language that has this the um, the rigor of integrity that the higher forms of language would have okay hmm. so yeah so high magic tends to become more intellectual more refined and low magic is that of the pagans and uh, the farm workers possibly hunter-gatherers <laughs> all right um, is one better than the other? Huh. No, of course not. However, learning high magic is extremely important. Okay, it's but for the way we live nowadays, uh, and we'll go over why it's important. And one of the things that we need to get past is this idea of higher being on top and like sort of stuck up. Okay. And then the on the the lower form being on the bottom. So if you really want to be developed as a practitioner of high magic, you need to be full bodied. You need to be. Uh, you need to know the realities of magic, which are all the way from the bottom to the top, not just the stuff that's on top. And this is the problem that. You know, people run into when they practice magic. When they get into ceremonial magic, a lot of it's very uppity and uh, philosophical and things like that, kind of divorced from workaday reality. And this this can be a problem, especially because the uh, ceremonial magic has the banishing techniques, which tend to be uh, quite powerful at producing egotism and paranoia and things like that because that's part of the enlightenment process you know um so the personality developing upwards sort of into this higher intellectual space that is part of human evolution apparently uh the the evolution that's happening on a cultural level now that as we develop ourselves cerebrally <laughs> Uh, intellectually um, and this gives us a great deal of power and versatility that does not really exist in the lower magic hmm. I can see I'm going to be running into lots of trouble here so yeah the idea was that the um, those who lived in the highland or the higher part of the land lived on the rocky terrain um, and the people who lived on the lower terrain um, were the farmers, the rural workers, okay? Um, there was an idea that the rural people who worked on the farms didn't have enough time to read and educate themselves. That's not necessarily true. Um, they did work really hard, but not during the winter so much. Yeah, they could read and stuff during the winter if they knew how. Question is, were they educated or not? <laughs> That's another question. But they did have time to uh, develop themselves more intellectually during the winter time. It's kind of like we still we still kind of do that. There's there's uh, the bookstores know that there's a reading season where they the the more serious, smarter, intellectual, introverted type reading is more popular in the winter time. And then the, the you know the more adventure oriented, comedy oriented, romance mystery is more popular in the uh, the summertime like a, a beach read <laughs> a beach read is casual not very challenging intellectually uh, that's because people during the winter time at least up north will retreat <laughs> into uh, their homes and can't really go outside it's too cold uh, there's not very much light <laughs> and uh, so they do more reading then 
so there was more there was time to do that for among rural workers as well as for the sort of wealthy uppity nobility this is why when you see forms of low magic boy that's really inappropriate isn't it and to use the word low magic for wicca and paganism uh Everything seems to revolve around agriculture, pretty much. It might be a little bit involved with seasonal herbs and migration of animals, that as well. But everything's linked to the land, and everything's very agricultural. Uh, when the harvest work is done, when, when the seeds are sown, when the fields are plowed, all the festivals that are related to that, there's the wheel of the year that pretty much revolves around agriculture. Uh, and um, the higher classes of nobility um, would even um, speak poorly of the lower classes, um, referring to their magic as heathen, heathenism, heathen, the people of the heath, people of the farms, right? Um, I refer to um, Paganus. Paganus is a Latin word for a, a person of the land and pagan. So these people who work the land are the pagans, of course. And then, of course, pagan eventually be, became associated with, uh, oh, those are the people who still worship the old gods. They don't worship this newer god of control and management, <laughs> civilization, right? Because uh, there was an older form of... Uh, connection to the earth uh, that is behind some of these pagan deities. Now, unfortunately, um, the Wiccan religion is based on agricultural deities. When, when agriculture came along, this was already a system of control. So the pagan, the pagan religions that were being imposed upon you know, people, they were already sort of fabricated as a means of control. And the original traditions that evolved out of nature, the original magic traditions were shamanism. And uh, these were really linked to the land. Okay, but the, the people who were farmers, they still had that connection to the land, to their livestock, to their um, herbs and their, their crops and their plants. They, would, they could still be taught remedies from the plants. The plants would actually talk to them. This is how close the connection was. You can do this, by the way. You can grow plants and you can sit with them and see what they have to impart to you. Okay, it's not 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 like, not like they're going to talk. But if you want to talk to them, that's that's a pretty cool practice. Uh, but yeah, just sit with them and notice that um, they do seem to communicate. It's quite interesting, actually, if you just give it some time. Anyway, so these people who worked the land, they were connected to nature in profound ways that intellectuals lost. They lost this thing, this connection to the land. This is really important now because the, the whole cycle of the Grail myth is all about this loss of connection to the land. Okay, The wound of the Fisher King, the, the king himself, has become sick, and it is because um, he's been wounded. <laughs> and um, they say, well, he's wounded in the thigh or in his side or something like that, right? So trying to indicate that he was stabbed in the genitals or something like that. Um, pretty much his lower body uh, was was hurt. Um, he had a he had a, a wound in his abdomen, and but that wound was symbolic really because the wound is actually the split between the mind and the land be between the king and the land between a human being and nature so that split between a human being and nature is the wound of the fisher king also called the wound of Amfortas. okay and that's a very important thing in the grail uh, legends uh, and this is the problem of high magic because High magic tends to be all uppity inside the head, unfortunately, and it needs to involve the body and nature and things like that. So a ceremonial magician could learn a lot 
from a pagan or from a Wiccan, let's say, or from a shaman, a real shaman, um, or from a farmer, or a ceremonial, a ceremonial magician could learn a lot from living on a farm, but at least having a garden and pets, something like that. Uh, and a pagan or a low magic pra practitioner can learn a lot from a high magic practitioner. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. That's a whole, this, this whole idea of the highlands and the lowlands. This has not always held true, by the way. Um, in Scotland, it was sort of reversed. The nobility lived down below and the the heathens, <laughs> the barbarians, um, the ones running around in the kilts <laughs> were in the highlands. Okay, so it wasn't all. It didn't always hold true that you know the nobility lived up on a hill, and then all the peasants lived down below. <laughs> okay, but that is the way it tended to play out, and that's how we get this high and low dichotomy thing. Um, but the high and the low becomes problematic too, because what's higher seems happier, what's lower seems sadder, what's higher seems more powerful, more I don't know, more free, and what's low seems to be kept down how does how do these things happen that's so the idea of high class and low class begins to develop okay and uh, if i were to tell you that the, the the manners and the etiquette and the education that a high class a high class person receives if I were to tell you that's not important, you would, of course, be like, well, wait a second. It is important, but it, there, there are just some problems with it. Okay, well, you know, why does everybody still want to go to college? Um, because they want to develop that sort of higher mind um, that is refined. Hmm. But problems develop from that because, oh, yes, you only have a bachelor's degree and I have a master's degree. Well, now, <laughs> that means I'm superior, right? And um, the interesting thing is that um, the things that are above and the things that are below tend to be referred to that way. So this idea of inferior and superior is in the language. So if, if you look at medical texts, um, in the, if something is in the upper, upper part of the body, it is superior. And if it's in the lower part of the body, it's inferior. Superior seems in, simply means above, and inferior means below. It does not mean it's better. But you can see how this <laughs> has a, um, sort of infected the thinking of the Western mind. Uh, that which is higher is better. That, that which is lower is worse. And um, like the Great Lakes that in the United States, the, the very large lakes to the north are called the Great Lakes. The one that's farthest north is called Lake Superior. Surprise, surprise. And it was labeled, it was named Superior because it was up above the others on the map anyway. <laughs> is it really above them? Of course not. It's just north of them. So... Uh, we should do a recap of how uh, religion evolved. Apparently, the original spirituality that evolved out of nature, which was natural, uh, was pretty much in the hands of shamans. And when you had hunter-gatherers, this is before agriculture, when you had people roaming about the land, following the migrations of the herds, uh, moving to different spots where food would be plentiful, but based on the time of the year, like you know, back and forth, back and forth, similar to the way birds do. Birds still migrate, and uh, in order to read the signs of nature, people got very intimate with the land, uh, and it tended to be true that that there was somebody very, very sensitive to the spirits of the land who would naturally tend to evolve in every group and that was a shaman and we still get inklings of this today where where people get really really sick and um, 
seems to be one of the things that schizophrenia is involved with. That schizophrenia seems to be a shaman that's trying to form. Um, if we could understand that a little bit better and take care of these people, they might emerge um, from their illness um, with special gifts, special powers, special abilities. Okay, well, but the shaman thing isn't really a thing for us anymore because civilization came along and uh, people began moving into these agricultural settlements and all these people living together in large numbers required order and uh, behavior control and all the different, every tribe and every shaman sort of had his own connection to the land or her own connection to the land which was different from the others kind of evolved this way and that way all over the place and these shamans and these tribes would not get along uh, and so the the king of the city-state had to do something about it and the answer is not necessarily that pleasant I'm, I'm sorry to say it is that basically they um, either banished the shamans or killed them uh, or they gave them a place within a new kind of spirituality, okay? But a sort of marginal space in the, in the new kind of spirituality. Mostly they were banished and killed. Uh, and they would move outside the city. They'd be like, okay, get out. Like, you're, you're a troublemaker, get out. <laughs> um, being spiritually enlightened is, is makes you into a troublemaker, actually, if you're not careful. Um, and, and a bit crazy, uh, or eccentric, as shamans tend to be, and and uh, so people would would miss their shamans. It's like, what do you, what do you just kick my priest outside the city? I guess I'm going to follow them. Oh, wait a minute! The king of the city state has just appointed a new priest, several new priests, and these new priests are all about the gods of the city and the gods of good behavior, and the gods of honor and duty and control, and, and, and the kinds of chores and preoccupations that I have, you know, like, uh, uh, so the new deities were really more contrived, uh, still based on some of the old stuff, of course. And uh, the priest was not somebody who evolved naturally. The priest was somewhat, somebody now appointed and the main goal was control. And this is how religion formed, fundamentally. Sorry to say. Um, it doesn't mean that um, religion didn't become genuinely spiritual here and there, but the fundamental premise of it was we need to establish control because we're living in such large groups now. And so this morality thing took over and good behavior and all this stuff. So. Uh, and still, to this day, it's really kind of astonishing. Like, um, when people get all spiritual, they get all moral and ethical, and this is good and this is evil. It's like, that's... The moral dimension of spirituality is just one dimension of it. it and But yet, people make the moral dimension into all of it, as though there's nothing else to religion except being good and being evil. You know, or being damned and being saved, you know. Oh, gosh, <laughs> there's so much more going on than that, you know. Uh, so, shamans don't really fit in anymore. And what we have now is uh, those who want some genuine spiritual practice, uh, they turn to the, the, the people who sort of developed... Uh, as heretics, heretics in these traditions. Like in the, within the Christian tradition, we have St. John of the Cross, and we have St. Teresa of Avila, uh, we have Meister Eckhart. These people, um, if they weren't, some of them were burned at the stake, actually. Um, uh, the three that I just referred to were not. Um, St. John of the Cross was imprisoned, and he pretty much, pretty much killed him, because he got really sick after that. Uh, yeah, and some people were actually burned at the stake. Um, so, thankfully that doesn't happen anymore. So you can, out of sheer desire, become more and more spiritual. 
but it doesn't have much to do with religion anymore. <laughs> you can't really go back to being a shaman. So, well, you, you take up some kind of magical practice, what these magical systems that evolved ever since civilization came about. And uh, so these magical systems that evolved, they are quasi-religious in nature, quasi-shamanic maybe in nature, and um, a little bit questionable. Uh, uh, there's a little bit of um, charlat charlatanry going on with them, with like snake oil. Um, what, what is it exactly we're doing when we do magic? You know, there's, there's so much... Uh, smoke and mirrors and shadow play and things like that uh that's because we're, we're delving into the realm of the soul into the realm of imagination and uh we're starting to get past the things that appear real to us and actually get to what's really real which we're not going to go into in this video <laughs> Uh, so if you want to become spiritual nowadays, you, you wouldn't become a shaman necessarily. You could. You could try. <laughs> um, but shamans tend to evolve naturally in hunter-gatherer tribes. Um, you could become a priest and hopefully become sort of a, a heretic, somebody who kind of breaks the mold of the role of the priest. Or you can basically become a ceremonial magician or a Wiccan, or a Pagan, or like a, a folk witch, something like that, right? Uh, and you can learn how to do this. And one of the most important things is that you develop both the higher and lower aspects of the magic. Okay, the, the magic that was connected to the land, which is the shamanism and the um, farming type, wheel of the year type stuff, like connection to the land, connection to nature. And you develop the hoity-toity intellectual stuff as well. Okay, and the idea of the god and goddess, you notice that we have high magic and low magic. Notice how high magic tends to be dominated by the god, by sort of Christianity or Yahweh of Kabbalah. Um, So, and then we have the Wiccan traditions and the folk witchcraft, witchcraft traditions tend to be dominated by the goddess, okay, or more feminine oriented, okay. Uh, there are male and female deities in the, in the craft as well. Um, what was associated with the land was uh, regarded largely as feminine, and what was associated with kingship, the person who lived on top of a hill in the highlands, right, in the castle, that was more of the god, the male, the, the masculine, okay? This is not rocket science. This is quite simple. If you remember that image of the, um, the, hill, the hill, do you remember the image of a standing stone pretty much in the uh, British countryside or there's, there's, uh, like Scotland and Ireland, we have the standing stones in the landscape. They stick up from the land. Uh, this is the phallic, so the standing stone is pretty much the male symbol and the land itself that it sticks out of is the fe female principle, okay? And so connection to the land was very important. And f the, remember that the illness that the king can suffer from is his detachment from the land. He has to remember that he arose from the goddess and that he will, when he dies, he will sink back down into her again. He is really nothing but an extension of the goddess. Okay, and this is why they would they will claim that the the feminine principle is all important in the um, in witchcraft and in the pagan traditions uh, for the most part. Um, but that isn't necessarily true. Um, if if you take the viewpoint of Yin Yang and Tao, this is Taoism. Uh, it's the Tao that's usually the most important. Okay, so the Yin is the female principle. The Yang is the male principle. Tao is the background behind all both of them, behind both of them, and so, and we've talked about this before. So when when Yang sinks back down into Yin, both of them cease to exist. Okay, you can't have one without the other. You can't have a foreground without a background. You can't have a background without without a foreground. 
So when when the when the when the the male principal withdraws and sinks back into the land, then you really there's nothing to see, because you have to have that sort of contrast between these two forces in order to see something manifest there. Okay, um, it's a very basic principle of manifestation, really. Uh, it's a sim it's a the basis behind the cross, <laughs> symbol of the cross. All right, so um, now the 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 male sort of principle rides, rises up from the land, and therefore it's it's at the high principle, the high magic, <laughs> and this is the low magic. Does that mean he is superior to the goddess? No, it does not. Okay, and it doesn't mean that there's nothing feminine up here at all either. In fact, it's all feminine because this is an extension of the goddess. So the 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 um, the male principle is is really an illusion anyway, as is the female principle. Okay, and so a king who does not take himself so seriously is a much better king, and that he's the king who doesn't suffer from any notion that he is a standalone entity. If he thinks he's above the land or above the law, um, if he, if he thinks he's above the land. Um, all kinds of bad things can happen. He becomes a tyrant, possibly. He begins to exert control over it. He doesn't understand that um, it's what sustains him, and this is what this is what produces the wasteland in the um, the Grail myths. The reason that the land has become a wasteland apparently is because the king does not recognize his. Uh, connection to the land uh, and this is something that we are suffering from to this to this very day of course uh, and it's something that ceremonial magicians potentially suffer from a lot okay uh, and it's something very important to know too because what are you doing why are you banishing earth every morning oh my god like what's wrong with Ben so you want to banish the earth so you really want to make yourself like free floating above it and just push it away and like you're like you're totally separate from it <laughs> we've already talked about the importance of banishing earth um every day and saturn for those who are in higher grades of the golden dawn uh because that idea of that separation needs to be explored so that it can be healed Okay, not so that it can be maintained like some kind of um, uh, state of psychosis. And so things were up in the sky tend to be then male, and the earth tends to be um, female, but this doesn't necessarily hold true. Um, for, for people who are very solar in nature, um, who like the sun, the sun god, things like that. Um, if the if the blinders get too tight, like in other words, if 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 um, people like that tend to be very, I don't know, monotheistic, my way or the highway must be this way. This is the one true god. That's the very solar archetype. Um, that archetype is very useful, but of course, um, it can get you stuck. In terms of everything must be one principle okay and so when things are more of the earth they're more diverse hmm. so things that are of masculine nature tend to be like this we, we're gonna go this way <laughs> Uh, and the things of a feminine nature means like, well, let's go all these different ways. Both are very useful, of course. And one of the things that we, um, everybody respects about the masculine force is its ability to set it, to set aside all these other things and focus on one thing at a time. Let's do this surgically, make a surgical strike that, okay, let's do that. All right. Let's withdraw back into the goddess and be comfortable again and, and, Look around and see lots of things, and then we'll it's, then we'll decide. Oh, now we're going to make another strike. We're going to go after this. We're going to take care of this. Okay, I see nothing but this. I'm going to take care of this. Okay, now I'm going to withdraw back and I look around again, <laughs> do some damage control. Okay, this is the male and female principles of the psyche at work. 
Now, the interesting thing is that we have evolved this way. So we've sort of evolved out of our gut into our heart and into our brain. And so we, we're kind of like standing stones. Okay. In fact, um, plant and plants, uh, the brain of a plant is its root system. That's pretty much the only brain it has for the most part. And it has a, ru a rudimentary nervous system as well. But its thinking part tends to be the roots. And that's its brain. People are the same. We actually have three brains. Okay, The first brain to evolve was the gut brain. And that is the brain that is in the intestines. And there's what, several hundred million neurons down there that are actually brain cells. And they, they form an axis with the, um, the, there's the gut brain, the enteric brain, there's the cardiac brain, the, the heart brain, and then there is the head brain, this cephalic, cephalic, cephalic brain. And this is the one that thinks it's in charge. Uh, the interesting thing is that a lot of your feelings, this is, er, everything works together, okay? But a lot of your feelings are, are sort of in the gut brain, like a lot, a lot of happiness, um, uh, down there, and if there's depression going on, it's a pro it's very often a problem with the gut microbiome and that health of the gut brain. Um, decision making happens a lot in the heart. It's uh, if you want to learn more about that, I would suggest reading Stephen Herod Buner, um, The Secret Teachings of Plants. It's a really cool description of how the heart is makes it. It's a big part in your decision making process. Um, and in fact, and the, the head tends to step in afterwards and say, oh, I did that. that <laughs> I made that decision, but it was really the heart that made the decision. Um, the, the heart is not that sophisticated, apparently. Uh, it, it only has um, maybe a several hundred thousand brain cells in it, whereas the, um, the, the head brain, the cephalic brain, has like um, billions and billions of uh, brain cells. Yes, the cephalic brain, the cardiac brain, and the enteric brain. It's interesting to think about this, too, because if you get a heart transplant, what would that be like? It would be a different person. You wouldn't quite be the same person anymore. And the interesting thing is that when your gut microbiome changes, your, your personality can change to some degree. To some degree it can. Uh, mainly in, in regard to um, a depression, happiness, or, yeah, joy, freedom, things like that. So now the important thing about high magic and low magic uh, is that when you develop the, the, the more refined forms of magic, it's mainly about the vocabulary and the sophistication of the concepts. Uh, and maybe just a, a basic, I can give a very basic example of why this is important, why the high magic is important. Um, being just like being a low magic practitioner, just being Wiccan pagan, to my mind, it's fine. It's, it's okay. But um, those who do really well with Wicca and folk magic, they also tend to develop a lot of the high magic stuff. They tend to be really nerdy and smart and organized or uh, try to be. Um, they have a lot of mercury going on as well as far as the um, intellectual component. Uh, a basic example would be um, in my work as a reading learning specialist, I work with some people who have not been exposed to a lot of vocabulary in any language. Okay, and then we'll do something with them where we, we will say, uh, let's figure out the tone of this passage. So we're going to read something. What's the tone of this? Um, and and they'll be, what do you mean? Well, this, this one's happy, this one's sad, this one's serious. This, they have just the most basic words for, for tone. And when you begin to teach them some other tone words, um, like melancholic, or forlorn, or regretful, 
or ashamed or celebratory, and they begin to learn these terms, it's almost as though they really weren't aware of these tones or feelings or emotions until they had a word for it. And so learning more words for these various emotional states tends to wake up those emotional states. Um, we develop an awareness of them through language. The, the, the interesting thing about high magic is that it's very dependent on language and images. By names and images are all powers awakened and reawakened. Um, now, the interesting thing is that the high magic um, would be more the names and the low magic would be more like the images, the primitive images. Okay. Uh, so keep that in mind. So you develop these philosophical, refi super refined ideas. They begin to develop some kind of consistency, some kind of coherency. And you begin to um, develop um, different powers of discernment because of the high magic aspects of your magical work. Okay, it's not just about being connected to the land and things like that. The reason I'm saying that is because um, if you are practicing low magic, you're going to mostly be, it's going to be more like a participation type thing. You're participating in the seasons, you're participating in the flow and the ebb and flow of the tides. Uh, this is very nice, but there's not much awareness of it going on. And so the real beauty of the high magic is that that separation begins to form, that that stone begins to rise, and you begin to advantage, to get some kind of vantage point over nature. This is really important when it comes to enlightenment because um, that that connection of the king in his control tower to the land is ecstasy. You can see it's very sexual too, right? Okay, um, so. Um, that and that separation from the ground of existence into that sort of um, control tower up here in your brain, this is an ecstatic experience. And you can't really have that very much without intensifying that separation. And so if you like to complain about ceremonial magicians becoming assholes mm -hmm. because they get so stuck in their heads and they get stuck up, um, this is part of the process. This is part of the process that they, that they go through um, as that separation intensifies. They basically make the wound of Amfortas, that split between the land and the king, they make it more intense so that they can explore how the separation has come about. And they can see that the separation really isn't real. Okay. Um, and what that brings us to is um, the way that you heal this. <laughs> this is going to sound really kind of, I don't know, a little too intellectual maybe. Um, there are two different types of hierarchy that sort of come to the rescue here. And what we tend to get stuck in in the West is the vertical hierarchy where let's say you have a paragraph and you have the main idea. Each paragraph, let's say, has a main idea, several supporting details, and maybe some minor details. Okay, So you have a, a paragraph has a, ma a main idea, some major details, and a minor minor detail. Okay, um, Many people would put the main idea on the top and then the major details right underneath that, and they the, the major details support the main idea, and the minor details then support the major details, like that. So the main idea is at the top, the major details support the main idea, those are the three, I guess, beige colored circles there, right? And then the gold colored, colored circles down below, those are the minor details which support the major details. And this is a vertical hierarchy, so that the main idea seems like the boss who's in charge of the subordinates. He's in his tower, or he's on his hilltop. He's in his castle at the top of the hill, 
and all these people in the lowlands are working for him. Okay, this is not really the way hierarchies work. But this is the model of civilization and organization that we have gotten stuck in. Okay, you might even call this the patriarchal hierarchy. Uh, it's got the king at the top, it's the big daddy, and he is in charge of his subordinates, bossing them around, and those those um, middle managers are bossing around the people below. That's a system of control. Shit goes downhill, that kind of thing, right? I'm exaggerating. Um, okay, so um, now one of the problems with the system is that is that it suffers from the wound of Ampertas. That king at the top is completely cut off, or seems to be cut off, from what's happening in that on that lower level. All he can hear is what his middle managers say, you know. So he's not connected to the land anymore. Let's say, okay. Um, this is artificial, though. This is not real. And so the antidote to this is the nested hierarchy, which we, we could say is more matriarchal. This is the same diagram as the one I just showed you. So I'm going to go back to the previous one. You've got a main idea as the boss that's on top. You've got the major details, which support the main idea. And you have the minor details, which support the major details. Here, the main idea is the largest circle. It encompasses them all. And you have the three major details, the large, the, the second largest circles, right? And then the minor details are inside those. This we could call matriarchal because, and then all the, the main idea is the big mother, and all these other ideas inside are like her babies. Okay, they are part of her. Okay, so a so a king who remembers this is absolutely in touch with everything. He remembers his connection to what's going on on the lower levels. Okay. He's in tune with the goddess. <laughs> Okay, so this is very important um, uh, when it comes to magical systems because what eventually happens is this whole idea of elevating yourself up high. That's very nice, but ultimately it's a matter of expanding out and encompassing everything. Also very nice, a little bit dangerous because it could be ego expansion, right? Um, or just that idea of dissolving into everything. Okay, or um, the king remembers that all of this is supported by the goddess. And he, and an interesting thing is that he becomes a supporter of the people. It's like, in other words, I, I'm going to give you what you need to do your jobs and make sure you get it. That he begins to work for them and doesn't have them just working for him. <laughs> okay, now um, now to look at the various hierarchies in ceremonial magic this way is very helpful. Very helpful, and the interesting thing though is that within the um, ceremonial magic systems, both the vertical hierarchies and the nested hierarchies operate at the same time. Okay, so there is a sort of stern attitude that somebody will take with a lesser spirit, let's say. Okay, but that stern attitude is not always going to be like patriarchal, like I'm looking at you from on high, from up here. I see you down there. Um, it's at the same time, it is, oh, I, I envelop you. I, I take you inside me. You have arisen within me. Um, and that's that's this is the whole idea of like, oh, something is arising in me, but I'm bigger than it. It's not going to take me over. It's just one of my little babies, <laughs> right? So when a spirit rises, it's more like, um, this thing can't take me over. I'm I'm the entire universe. It can't possibly, you know, take me over. I'm, I am the goddess. So it's just one of my babies. And so what does it need? I need to take care of this thing and help it do what it does. 
Okay. Whereas if you have a vertical hierarchy going on, it's like, oh no, we have an uprising. <laughs> and this this lesser detail is going to try to go climb up to the top and take take control of <laughs> everything else, right? Um, uh, and both of these types of um, hierarchies exist at the same time. Uh, and it's good to be able to, to see the, the universe or various systems of control in terms of both types of hierarchies. Um, and so this idea of high magic, making sure that you develop um, your, ma making sure that you develop yourself from the bottom to the top, not just all the top. That's all these intellectual concepts. I have all the intellectual concepts I need. Now I can control everything down below without having to think about it or deal with it. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so um, everything is part of you. And that's come, that idea comes to the rescue. So every, you can feel everything. Everything is um, to make you a better boss too, really. So you, um, you'll, you'll visit the subordinates. You'll see what they're doing. You'll even take part in what they're doing to see what, it, what it's like. Uh, you'll make sure they have what they need, make sure they're happy doing what they do. Yeah, it's good stuff. Hmm. So the idea of high magic is, is not um, high at the top of the tower, and that's all there is to you. You are the entire tower, and you're also the earth that supports the tower. Okay, and without those refined, high-level concepts, um, you can't experience the the joy and the bliss and the freedom of the apparent freedom of being able to, I don't know, discern, um, to experience. It's sort of like, you know, God can't really experience himself unless he sort of gets lost in this sort of high-minded perspective so he can now arise in this human type creature and look around um, and this is the experience of like you you walk through a garden and you're looking at a flower and it's like wow that flower can't really quite appreciate just how beautiful it is but wait a second it can it can do that through me and how lucky i am to be this developed to experience that kind of bliss. Okay, so now that's why it's people who are refined and, you know, hoity-toity. They also tend to have good taste. They also tend to be able to enjoy things to astonishing degrees. Okay, otherwise... Um, if you don't develop that very much, you'll you'll end up more like sort of indigenous people who are who are kind of coasting along in something called the participation mystique, where everything is just totally immersed in the land, and everything is just kind of unconscious. It's like okay, the um, this is what time of year it is. This is what I need to go do. I'll go do it. Okay, now now uh, now this has happened. Now I need to go do that. Okay. There's no time to really um, see things from that sort of detached perspective or that sort of control tower perspective, which isn't necessarily real, but it's the essence of what it means to really appreciate what it's like to be living in the world. Okay, so, um, and this is why we do the middle pillar work, because the middle pillar work is that connection from all the way from the gut, through the heart, to the head, so it's not all head stuff. Uh, and a lot of times for somebody who's especially intellectual, um, the middle pillar can be quite traumatic sometimes. It can induce the letting go experience, which can feel like you're being assaulted from down below because you thought everything was pretty much up here and you had everything under control, but, but you're suffering from the wound of Amfortas. And as that wound heals, then the energy connects, the energy connection between your gut and your brain, let's say, becomes strengthened, which is going to annihilate the ego, which, which can be traumatic, tr actually truly frightening experience. It's like dying. Okay, And that's why the king, in these old pagan myths, 
would be sacrificed for the good of the land, right? At least ritually sacrificed. So he would ceremonial, ceremonially die and then be reborn from the land, um, mainly just to indicate that, uh, to make that connection to the goddess. It's like, I'm nothing but an extension of nature here. I don't regard myself as being superior to nature. I've simply arisen in this role, very highly developed in this role, supposedly, um, and am, am able to exert a lot of um, influence um, being so highly developed like this, but only because of my connection to the land. Okay, and this is what ceremonial magicians need to remember. Uh, and that's why we need to become gardeners and need to have pets, maybe go live on a farm, uh, need to exercise, uh, uh, take care of the body, those kinds of things. Um, respect the body, respect the sun, the moon, expose yourself to the elements. Get some sun, for heaven's sake. It's good for you. Don't listen to your dermatologist. Oh, my God. All right. Well, hopefully that made sense. So uh, until next time.